The same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. Welcome. This is amazing that you're all here. I'm Eileen Boris, and I'm the Hull Professor and Chair of the Women's Studies Program here at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And along with my colleague, Rissel Perennis of Asian American Studies at UC Davis, we've put together this conference on intermittent labor as an interdisciplinary conversation on domestic care and sex work. Intimate labor occurs in homes, institutions, urban spaces, and other locations. It exists along a continuum of service and caring labor. And against a scholarship that considers nurses and nannies, home aides, cleaners, prostitutes, therapists, and hostesses apart from each other, this contrast conference seeks to explore intimate labor as a useful category of analysis to understand gender, racial, class, and other power relations, as well as to look at the current economic transformations in the United States and globally. This conference is being recorded, hopefully for UCTV, and so when it comes to questions and answers later, we're going to ask you to speak in a mic. Now, of course, all conferences are work of labor as well as love. And this conference is presented by the Center for Research on Women and Social Justice and the Women's Studies Program at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And I have to thank our wonderful staff at, UC, at Women's Studies at UCSB, and I have to thank our conference organizer, Elizabeth Shermer. So let's give Ellie a big hand. <laughs> 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 We're also sponsored by the University of California Labor and Employment Research Fund, the University of California Humanities and Research Institute, the University of California Santa Barbara College of, College of Letters and Sciences, the Division of Social Sciences, the Hull Chair in Women's Studies, the Women's Center, the uh, Center for the Study of Work, Labor, and Democracy, the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center, where we're gathered. And from the uh, University of California at Davis, we also have funding from the College of Humanities, Arts, and Culture. So I just wanted to tell you a note from our sponsors. This is the kickoff of the conference. Tomorrow we'll meet again here for a keynote at uh, 9.30.10, and then for a series of panels and um, sessions. But I want to uh, go to tonight's speaker. And because in having a conference on labor, women's labor, and questioning what is work, who is a worker, and these connections. We do this not merely as an academic enterprise, but out of the belief that our research matters. California nurses, says Representative John Con Conyers, Jr., they're the biggest, baddest group there is. In 2005, the CNA gained notoriety and acclaim for hounding Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger and defeating his anti-worker initiatives during a special election. Last summer, 
It joined with Michael Moore in promoting Sicko, which many of you probably have seen, as part of its long-standing campaign for universal health care, patient rights, and against the corporate takeover of the health care system. The CNA and its National Nurses Organizing Committee has been in the forefront of pushing for universal health care out of the belief there is a connection between the labor done on the wards by nurses and the social advocacy for health care for all. A former UCSB sociology graduate student, Rose de Moro, joined the union in 1986, served as director of collective bargaining until 1993, when she assumed her current position as executive director. Now, Rose actually is not here tonight because she is in the Bay Area. Some of you may have listened to the news today. And the nurses in 15 Bay Area hospitals run by the Sutter Healthcare Corporation are preparing for the largest RN strike in California in nearly 10 years next week. So when the CEO of called a mediation meeting today, Rose had to say, okay, I gotta go to the mediation meeting and I can't go to the intimate labors conference. But that doesn't mean we're not represented by the CNA. And Sutter Healthcare Corporation, just to tell you some of the context of some of the stakes of what this is about, is uh, attempting to slash patient care uh, services in San Francisco and the Bay Area. Uh, they're targeting for cutbacks hospitals that are serving the indigent in places like the Mission District with St. Luke's to eliminate emergency and acute care services so that there would be no nurses uh, in the ER room between 3 and 11 p.m. and they'd just be on call. So it's part of the struggle of the CNA has been to connect patient rights with uh, the conditions of work for nursing. And one of the people at the forefront of that over many years is today's speaker, and that's Jill Ferrillo, who is a nurse and the national outreach director of the California Nurses Association. Before coming to the CNA, Jill was an executive vice president of the registered nurses division of 1199, the New York Health and Human Services Employees Union. In that capacity, she helped lead collective bargaining and new organizing campaigns. With the CNA, she was the principal lobbyist for uh, its safe staffing bill that was signed into law by the former governor, Gray Davis, in which Governor uh, Schwarzenegger attempted to ignore and, and really got the wrath not only of the nurses but of the whole community. So without much do, let us welcome Jill Farrell. Thank you and good evening. Uh, California Nurses Association is really honored to be invited to present at this conference. We think that the work that you're doing is uh, so fundamentally important uh, to today's world and certainly to uh, the struggle for women's rights and for labor's, uh, labor rights as well. Um, I'm sorry that Roseanne DeMauro is not here. She is a comrade in arms. We've worked together now for 14 years with the California Nurses Association. Um, actually, our families come from the same province in Italy, so um, maybe we're related, so <laughs> that might make it a little bit um, easier. Uh, first of all, I would like to say um, that uh, ask you a question how many of you have seen the movie sicko michael moore's movie okay once how many have you seen it how many have seen it twice yeah okay all right so those are the people all right i just wanted to recognize my um sicko people <laughs> um and and the reason i bring that up is that um you know michael moore asked the question in his movie who are we and this question is posed during a particularly disturbing sequence in which Kaiser Permanente and other hospitals are dumping poor and uninsured patients on Skid Row in downtown LA rather than pay for the cost of their health care. Who are we is a question that we really need to all ask. 
have we as a society become so desensitized to the corruption and com commercialization of our society that we can ignore and accept hospitals treating people as garbage to be tossed out on the street because they cannot afford health care. The health care industry that I know and that I've worked in and that I have to deal with day in and day out is greedy, callous, and brutal. It's all of that. But we have to admit that the blame for this can be shared. We as a society and we as a progressive community have allowed our politicians, our media, our political system to get away with protecting, perpetuating, and reinforcing an inhumane market-based insurance industry that controls our health care system. The avatars of the status quo, those who apologize for conventional wisdom or political realism, always say, lower your expectations. We cannot achieve fundamental change. We're hearing that a lot these days, especially with the health care debate in California. These also can share the blame. What we need today is real leadership to achieve guaranteed health care for all. We need moral and political leadership that is unwilling to accept inferior standards, limits on our vision, and barriers on our humanity. Right now, registered nurses in California are in the forefront of a movement to transform our health care system. We are working in alliance with organized labor, with progressive community and health care activists. We ask why nurses? Why would nurses be in the forefront of this movement? We would say because of the gendered role of nursing and health care and the confluence of intimate labor and service occupations and professions. Because for nurses, there has always been an organic link between patient advocacy and social advocacy that is endemic to our role in the delivery of care and the intersection of our fight for the health and safety of our patients, our patients' families, and our patients' communities. These are all linked. Because nurses had to transition from individual efforts on their own behalf to collective action, to protect our patients and to promote improved standards for ourselves and our colleagues and to improve the health of all of our patients and potential patients and to fight for the socioeconomic changes in society that affect people's health. When the role of hospitals changed at the beginning of the 20th century from chronic care to acute care, intimate labor was a central function of hospital nursing. What did nurses do? Cleaning dressings, changing bandages, applications of heat and cold, taking temperatures, application of ice bags or bathing to control fevers, monitoring and observation were all the purview of the registered nurse. Nurses instilled and removed air and gases and fluids. They used inhalers, tents, and other devices to deliver various kinds of respiratory and oxygen therapies. They use tubes and other devices to suction, evacuate, douche, irrigate, place catheters in body cavities. And let's face it, it just doesn't get much more intimate than that. And I can tell you that these hands here, I've been a nurse for 25 years, have been very intimate with thousands of people in those body cavities. The constellation of the gender identification of nursing and the stigma associated with hands-on care fostered and reinforced the hierarchy of gendered and class-based divisions within the medical system. This blending of gender stratification and the tainting of intimate labor created an institutional scaffolding built upon and exploited by the market forces in corporate health care that devalued and continues to devalue nurses. It forced nurses to employ forms of personal struggle and collective action to transform our status, our ability to upgrade conditions for patients, and ultimately ourselves. And it gave us the training, the experience, and the expertise that facilitated the evolution for many nurses 
from patient advocate to social advocate. The conditions that they faced in the early years turned many nurses into advocates and activists in one form or another. First, they had to struggle for professional acceptance and recognition. So the earliest movement of nurses, often led by upper and middle class women and reformers, were for the founding of nurses associations like the California Nurses Association, which was founded in 1905. And the struggle at that time was to pr promote nursing education and professional standards for nursing practice that were independent of the domination of doctors and hospital administrators. Educational improvements were continually fought by physicians who wanted nurses to be just trained subordinates. With the rise of acute care hospitals and hospital nursing, nurses had to confront wave after wave of corporate assaults on their practice, their conditions, and their standards. Low pay, chronic overwork plagued the staff nurse and limited the number of more experienced graduate nurses who were willing to work in hospitals. The early days of hospital nursing also saw the rise of scientific management and other management restructuring schemes intended to commodify medical care and combat the nascent efforts of nurses at that time challenging their gendered and exploited status. Some nursing administrators welcomed what they viewed as progress in the application of scientific management, rationality, order, and efficiency as means to bring and enforce professional control in nursing to free nurses from shackles of physician and administrator control and upgrade nurses through more professional training. These nursing leaders contended that efficiency was to be the bridge between service and science and the key to supposed objective practices and expert status accorded science that would also reduce the barriers associated with intimate labor and gender stratification. But in the process, they accommodated or ignored the economic exploitation and nursing ideology that stressed strict discipline and subservience that undermined the original goals of the nurse reformers who had worked to advance the professional character of nurses. To hospital administrators, of course, efficiency had a very different meaning, which was to obtain more work from nursing staff and combined with the techniques of scientific management, further reduce the ability of bedside nurses to control their practice and elevate their economic standards. It's very interesting, but the, the themes and the jargon and the goals that we see in efficiency and order campaigns from the Roaring Twenties are almost identical to those same themes that we see today in restructuring uh, uh, schemes that are going on in our hospitals today. Now I'd like to discuss uh, the changing role of nurses. Medical specialization and the repeated introduction of new technology also had a dramatic effect on nurses' roles. A significant component of the work of nurses now entailed educating patients about new devices, getting patients to accept and comply with their use, and alleviating their fears about the use of these devices. Nursing has thus been the soft technology that has ensured the compliant use of the hardware of healthcare. Nursing educators and administrators were among those per pushing for a greater scientific role for professional nurses as part of their campaign to evade what they considered the odious associations of intimate labor in a culture that historically viewed hands-on body work as dirty work. Through adaptation of technology, they believed that nurses could scientize and therefore sanitize nursing. Technology allowed nurses to replace or at least mitigate the intense body intimacy of nursing with the technical and measured intimacy of medicine. The use of technology along with antibiotic and intravenous therapy eroded the traditional forms of intimate labor. Whereas, just using an example, bathing a patient used to be a life-saving activity to reduce a patient's fever from infection. Now an injection of penicillin eradicated the infection faster, more effectively, and more reliable, 
with much less effort. However, nurses did not gain the prestige that using scientific equipment ought to have given them in a culture that revered science and technology. Nursing continued to be valued, or should I say devalued, not by scientific practice, but in fact by gender. As a result, nurses were poorly compensated, typically had no health benefits, no sick pay, no retirement security, and worked long hours in understaffed hospitals. While the elite nursing hierarchy, which also dominated the professional associations like the California Nurses Association and the American Nurses Association, viewed bedside nursing as merely a distasteful step up the ladder to supervision and management, still 90% of nurses were working as staff nurses at the bedside. They were workers. Increasingly, they realized that they could not count on their hospital administrators or the nursing elite to advocate for their living standards, their livelihood, and health security any more than they could depend on them to make quality, safe patient care their top priority. So by the 1930s, nurses in growing numbers understood that the only solu solution to this was collective action and, yes, unionization. Now, you can imagine that unionization absolutely horrified nursing administrators, and, of course, the professional associations and hospitals as well. And the battle for staff nurses' breakthrough took years. California nurses, of course, led the way from the very beginning. In 1946, the California Nurses Association signed the first collective bargaining agreements for registered nurses anywhere in the nation. Some of the terms of those contracts are telling. Minimum, minimum salaries of $200 a month, overtime pay, paid holidays, vacations, and sick leave, and employer-paid health insurance, $200 a month. At that time, it was a lot of money. <laughs> the hospital industry and its scientific management consultants responded to the emergence of unionization among nurses to seek new ways to reduce nurses' new growing power and to promote class divisions and de-skilling of the nursing profession. At that time, a new classification of nurses was created called licensed practical nurses. Afri African American women were then tracked into that classification in nursing schools and the hospital industry. They were paid less and made responsible for many of the intimate labor and domestic roles formerly reserved for registered nurses. For registered nurses, the consequences of the industry counterattack and the refusal of their own trade association leaders to support stronger, more forceful collective action, such as strikes, as she mentioned, the Sutter strike, <laughs> stalled additional progress. It would be another 20 years after their very first contracts were signed before registered nurses were able to make the next leap forward. In 1966, with nurses fed up with heavy workloads and poor conditions, that dam finally broke. At Eden Hospital in the Bay Area, nurses who were paid less than gardeners submitted mass resignations. They were followed by 71% of registered nurses at 32 other hospitals who also submitted mass resignations. Now, what you might call that is a general strike. But since it wasn't a strike, it was a resignation. You couldn't call it a general strike. But just imagine, 71% of nurses resigning in 32 hospitals certainly was a health care crisis in the Bay Area. These actions that produced, finally, major economic gains. It also prompted the nursing elite, who dominated many of the professional associations, like the California Nurses Association and the American Nurses Association, and had close ties to hospital administrators to finally drop their no-strike pledge that had limited the collective power of nurses for decades because they feared mass resignations were actually more disruptive to their operations than strikes. Maybe that's what the Sutter nurses ought to be considered. <laughs> the next step was the nation's first nurses' strike in 1969. Significantly, the key issue in the first strike, which is, again, a Bay Area walkout in 1969, was patient care, 
with nurses demanding committees controlled by staff nurses themselves that would give them a direct voice in patient care delivery. Again, trying to protect their relationship with their patients and intimate labor. That was the key issue in that strike. With the success of that strike, nurses were on the picket lines again, 4,000 of them at 42 hospitals in 1974, in which they won both economic gains and additional protections for patients. Nurses were learning that collective action and increased union organizing also gave nurses a more effective voice in winning new patient protections and also moving them into the legislative and regulatory arena. It was just two years after the 1974 strike that California was forced to enact the nation's first minimum staffing standards with nurse to patient ratios for intensive care units. And California remained at that time the only state to have any minimum standards for staffing in hospitals. And we believe that this was directly related to um, the empowerment of the California Nurses Association, nurses, and certainly uh, the strike. CNA discovered that the power of its members in collective action led to a newfound influence across the board in Sacramento, winning breakthroughs in regulatory standards, nursing education, and new legislation for nurses and patients. Now, the decade of the 1990s ushered in the most dramatic changes yet. Healthcare had become a very big business with the corporate takeover of hospitals and other sectors of the healthcare industry. Here in California, we began to see the elimination of our community hospitals as we once knew them. These hospitals, smaller community hospitals, were taken over by larger health care change through mergers and acquisitions. This corporate um, activity was eliminating the nurses' ability to control their practice. And uh, what we found is that uh, th these major health care chains dominated the industry uh, th up and down the state. Also at that time, managed care was promoted as the way to cut cost, which it did by limiting patient access to care and replacing registered nurses with lesser licensed or unlicensed nurses. Management consultants were being brought in with cookie cutter restructuring models that, it, that were imported from the manufacturing sector, which they had eviscerated in the 1980s. Many of these consulting companies had come right out of the auto industry. The same consultants were moved into healthcare to run these time and motion studies to figure out how to be more, quote, efficient. But of course, nurses knew what that was all about. Nurse administrators who led the organizations like the California Nurses Association at that time were slow to react or in open collusion with the hospital industry. The result was a heightened conflict between the nurse executives and the working nurses, which I said back earlier was 90% of nursing, remained 90% of nursing, and even today is 90% of nursing. The bedside nurse is the dominant nurse. And this was, a, this was a conflict that resulted in a staff nurse revolution at the California Nurses Association that created a tsunami in the escalation of nurses' collective activism, followed by a broader public voice in the fight for ourselves, our patients, and ultimately, other social, social changes. This sea change started with a strike at Summit Medical Center in Oakland in 1992 that was prompted by a corporate hospital merger and attempts by the newly merged company to divide its hospital staffs and all of the different unions that were in that hospital. California Nurses Association had begun to ally itself with other unions uh, to have allies in the struggle, not just for nurses' rights, but for patients' rights and communities' rights. This strike went on for seven weeks and was marked by a militancy and creative use of corporate campaign tactics by the nurses and six other unions involved in the strike, which was unprecedented in health care. Health care was not used to this kind of activity. The strike victory sent shock waves through the industry which then, of course, stepped up ep ep their efforts to divide the unions while their allies in nursing management sought to purge the staff nurse leadership and their leaders on the CNA staff. And our, uh, at that time, we had 14 staff members who were fired 
at the California Nurses Association, and Roseanne DeMauro, who I'm standing in for, was one of those people. <laughs> Actually, at that time, I had, I, they were in, in the process of bringing me, I was in New York at the time, bringing me over, and I had just gotten the job, and then I got fired <laughs> before I even got the job. After a year-long fight, staff nurses ousted the old regime and made CNA the first nurses organization run by bedside nurses with a staff drawn for the, from the most progressive wings of the labor and political movements. The new organization immediately charted a course with several broad goals, and I want to talk about those. The first goal was to have a more aggressive challenge to corporate restructuring and the assault on nurses and patient care standards. And one of, those, one of the things that we did is we filed some lawsuits basically to organize nurses around uh, against restructuring at hospitals in the Bay Area. One particular uh, uh, egregious example happened at Alta Bates, which is in Berkeley, where they re were removing registered nurses from the bedside uh, and to replace them with unlicensed, uh, unlicensed people in labor and delivery <laughs> so that you would have maybe one nurse for every five laboring patients in labor and, deli labor and delivery. So nurses were quite outraged about that. And then number two, a more outspoken advocacy for patients' rights and new alliances. There she is. That's Roseanne DeMauro. And that, that is in front of Alta Bates Hospital. <laughs> Again, a more outspoken advocacy for patients' rights and new alliances with patients and consumer activists and organizations against the common advers adversary of corporate medicine and managed care. And here you see some of the um, literature that we used when we filed a ballot initiative back in 1996 to radically reform managed care at the time. Uh, you know, we were first making patients and making the community aware of the dangers of managed care, which you know it was designed to limit access to health care, deny care, delay care, and refuse care. Number three, we stepped up the education and mobilization of nurses. It was really important to our organization that we could, uh, could go out and meet with our members, go hospital by hospital, and educate our members about uh, what were the forces that were out there that were making their lives so miserable? A lot of folks just didn't understand what was going on. So we stepped up our education of our members because we felt by this education they would be more fully engaged in the fight against managed care. Number four, a new focus on union organizing that ultimately led to a tripling of the CNA membership in the past 15 years. And I want to use the Catholic Healthcare West chain as an example, a chain very close to my heart because um, I was raised as a Catholic, so <laughs> and I went to Catholic school and had some bizarre kind of experiences. So organizing within that system was just my little way of payback. And I I <laughs> I, I participated in I participated in almost every one of these um, campaigns um, for personal as well as political reasons. Uh, now, as you can see, when we first started uh, the campaign in 1993, we represented nurses in four hospitals in the Bay Area in the Catholic Healthcare West. And after we um, uh, put, in, put our resources into organizing the unorganized and um, engaged our members in that fight, as you can see, this is where we are today with Catholic Healthcare West. We have 10,000 members alone just in Catholic Healthcare West in 25 hospitals in California. And we are now organizing another Catholic Healthcare West course. So I'm on my way up to Reno, um, in Reno, Nevada, uh, which uh, we just filed for an election yesterday. So we continue to uh, go wherever they are. As well, um, we had, and, there, and this is the Catholic Healthcare West division of nurses, which is a very powerful division. Uh, we will all be going to the bargaining table together in 2009 to bargain a one master contract with Catholic Healthcare West, which is going to be really exciting. I'll be leading those negotiations, and I cannot wait. Then we have, of course, the Tenant Corporation. Many of you uh, may be familiar, if you're from Santa Barbara, you might be very familiar with the Tenant Corporation. They used to have their, uh, their corporate headquarters here in Santa Barbara. Um, they got caught with their hands in the cookie jar, if you will, um, Medicare fraud, and as a result, they, um, they left the state. <laughs> They're now in Dallas, but they still own a few hospitals. They, own, they used to own several hospitals in California. When we started out in 2003, we represented nurses in, I think I see five hospitals. 
Uh, today, we, uh, as you see, we have um, tripled our membership in the Tenant Corporation and hospitals formerly owned by Tenant who have, who have uh, subsequently been sold. But we have organized within those facilities, and we continue to organize in Tenant where we just uh, negotiated a, a contract with them just a, a month ago. And that gives us organizing rights in tenant facilities throughout the country. So they own about 65, 70 hospitals. And so we are going to be very busy in the next few years organizing tenant facilities throughout the country. OK, what else did we do? This is our, our tenant vision. This, this also uh, reflects our growth, the CNA growth. From the time that we had our staff nurse revolution and we decided to um, you know, put our resources into organizing the unorganized, you see that uh, we've tripled our membership. We also uh, decided that we needed to involve our members in mass mobilization as a means to affect legislative change for the benefit of nurses and patients. And here you see, uh, this is a demonstration in front of the Capitol where we were uh, advocating for the first nurse to patient ratio bill to be signed anywhere in the country and it was signed into law by Governor Gray Davis in 1999. We mobilized nurses, union nurses, non-union nurses. We mobilized the community by writing letters, by demonstrating at the Capitol, going to hearings, threatening our, <laughs> our, our administrations in our hospitals. And basically, um, this was one of the most important struggles because nurses at that time we're fighting for nurse to patient ratios. Why? Because nurses were being removed from their patients. If you have, you know, 10 patients or 12 patients, you're not going to have any time to develop that intimate relationship that you need to have with your patient in order to have the best patient outcome. So the fight to have nurse to patient ratios was the fight to have an intimate relationship with the patient. Number six, a more public call for the transformation of our healthcare system from a corporate market-based system to a single-payer patient care-based system. We participated in the ballot initiative back in 1994, which would have established a single-payer healthcare system in California. And today, we are still involved in that debate. We are strong advocates and the sponsor of uh, Senator Sheila Kuehl's bill, S SB 840, which would establish a single-payer system in California. And we are strong advocates for H.R. 676, which is John Conyers' bill, which would establish a single-payer health care system in this country. Number seven, the building of a national registered nurse movement and a national profile for CNA and aligning with a national movement of working people such as the AFL-CIO. And you can see here the slides where we have now moved into the state of Texas. We are building a RN movement in the state of Texas as well as in we represent nurses now in Chicago. We represent nurses in Maine. We are organizing, uh, again, Texas and, and many, many, other, many other states, Nevada. Uh, in Texas, we have a very, very strong RN movement, which is, was, kind of, was kind of surprising to us. But the nurses have been incredibly responsive, where they had uh, marches and demonstrations to try to enact nurse-to-patient ratios in Texas. And you can well imagine that uh, hospitals and the good old boys in Texas are not too happy about uh, this organizing effort in Texas, but we're pretty excited about it. Social unionism and social, social change. Because manufacturing is more profitable than service, the marketplace transforms as much service as possible into manufacturing and spits out the remainder if it can. Nursing is a problem for the private health care industry because it is a service. To maximize profits, or in the case of nonprofit companies, we call it surplus revenues, hospitals and clinics seek to restrict nurses' scope of practice on both ends of the scale by de-skilling nurses. First, through technological innovation, management minimizes opportunities for the exercise of, of professional judgment. And I just want to give you one example of that. This is a current trend, and it's a very disturbing trend. Uh, what hospitals are, are introducing, and they're spending billions of dollars to introduce uh, information technology in our hospitals that would create programs that basically diagnose patients and give you uh, spit out care plans for you to follow. And if the nurse or the doctor, frankly, does not follow those programs, then you, know, you can be disciplined. 
And, and what these programs are based upon is based upon, uh, you know, data that's been put into the computer that, you know, takes into consideration certain people. But the problem is, is that you're going to have many, many people that don't fit uh, those programs. And they have individual needs that would not be recognized. I'll give you an example of that. Um, I don't know how many of you are football fans, but <laughs> if you are, raise your hand. <laughs> okay. Not, not many. Okay. Not in this audience. <laughs> but I want to use this example anyway. <laughs> Maybe you'll be a football fan. No, you won't, actually. Um, so here's an example, and only because this is currently in the news. Um, recently, there was a, a football game a couple of weeks ago where a uh, football player sustained a massive injury. You might have heard about this, to the spinal cord. And, uh, and this, uh, this injury, uh, you know, could have made him paraplegic or quadriplegic for the rest of his life. And uh, there was a, a doctor who was watching TV. He was actually a, a sports fan or a football fan watching TV. And uh, he saw what happened. And so he had just read that, that weekend, he had read a journal that um, had discussed using normal saline uh, IV therapy and just icing it. And by icing that IV therapy, that that could potentially reduce the amount and the kind of injury in spinal cord injuries. And so this doctor called up the TV station and was able to get through to those doctors and talk to them about using this therapy. And as a result, the doctors used that therapy. Now, we cannot say, I cannot say that it was that therapy that made the difference, but certainly the prognosis for this football player was very, very poor. But after this therapy was, um, was utilized, uh, his, prognos his prognosis is very, very good. And I'm, and I'm using that example because that would not appear, because it's just recently in the literature, that would not appear in these information programs. So that if a doctor were to use something like that, that doctor could face discipline and the nurses could face discipline. So that's what's going on with this information technology. And, and I bring that up because we're talking about um, nurses losing their, in, their, their use of independent judgment with their patients with this information technology. And therefore, again, affecting the, uh, the, the relationship that we have, the intimate relationship that we have with our patients. Hospitals are investing billions of dollars in this, in this technology and restructuring schemes intended to make healthcare more efficient and thus more profitable by eliminating registered nurses' exercise of independent professional judgment in response to patient needs. Now, I want to tell you that in our Catholic Healthcare West contract that we just negotiated, and I know that the Sutter nurses are uh, trying to get this language as well, we were able to um, negotiate language and they were also facing the threat of a strike in order to get that, that basically says that registered nurses can override this technology and that if we are able to identify technology that would in any way restrict our independent professional judgment, that we can override that technology. So that was very important for us to win that. Now, in addition, hospitals work to lure and coerce registered nurses into giving up intimate labor into abandoning direct care of the patient at the bedside and becoming administrators, data entry clerks, and telenurses working in call centers far from the patient. Hospitals aspire to sever the connection between the registered nurse's body and the patient's body by relegating intimate labor to LVNs, nurses' aides, who have less bargaining power and less training and therefore less cultural capital. Nursing is a problem for the private health care industry, not only because it is a service, but also because registered nurses are empowered by professional status to exercise control over the standards of patient care, and that is our fight every day. Women and men enter nursing because human relationships are of paramount importance to them. That is why they go into nursing. Their needs are met, at least in part, by meeting the needs of their patients. Physical intimacy is crucial because it is the means by which the patient's needs are communicated. No protocol, no checklist, no tele telenursing decision tree can produce the rich, multidimensional relationships that grow from the concern and trust necessary to intimate labor in patient care, relationships between nurses and patients, but also between nurses 
and family members of the patient. Most of you have probably experienced such relationships personally. They are priceless, but to the private health care industry, they are valueless and inefficient, and therefore the industry strives to eliminate them. The relation of bodies to each other cannot be extracted from health care and isn't subject to mass production. In health care, intimate labor is irreducible, and as such, it can be and has to be a site of resistance. It is the industry's Achilles heel. It can never be turned over to the patient, outsourced to foreign markets, or digitized, or converted into a manufactured product of commercialized care. It presents an opportunity for organized labor to frustrate the ambition of industry players, an opportunity repla to replace them with a healthcare system that serves the larger social good rather than the interest of Wall Street investors and the Wall Street profiteers. Now we know that there are multiple roadblocks. Politicians who are co-opted by the industry's wealth and even some union leaders who betray the public interest due to opportunism and narrow self-interest and expediency. Promoting incremental change through health care reform plans that only perpetuate and expand this insurance-based system is just an example. Unions that promote labor management partnerships and offer themselves as agents for adding value to capital rather than advocating for the health and well-being of our communities are a very insidious problem. But for nurses, the relationships created through intimate labor can be an impetus to a truly radical resistance transcending their own economic self-interest. Unlike some other types of intimate labor, nursing empowers the caretaker, caretaker in relation to the person cared for. A patient is neither an employer nor a customer. Insurance aside for the moment, illness is a great leveler. Patients are people at their most vulnerable, regardless of their socioeconomic status. They are dependent on nurses and don't have the means to exploit them. Because RNs are patient advocates first, and because they must have decent compensation and decent working conditions and freedom of speech in order to care and advocate for their patients, the interests of RNs and patients are naturally aligned. For this reason, RNs are uniquely positioned to take up the banner for social unionism. Intimate labor is vital to conscientious patient care and to patient advocacy. Intimate labor is also the source of registered nurses' singular moral authority, the power of which was demonstrated by the California Nurses Association resounding political victory over Arnold Schwarzenegger, our governor in his ill-conceived special election of 2005. As you can see here, this was, uh, th that, was that, that banner was, that banner is, was where we actually went to his conference on women. It was a women's conference. And we had organized a demonstration out in front of the women's conference because he was trying to, you know, take away the ratios that we had fought so hard to win. And um, so we decided to bring that to his women's conference and we got inside the conference and unfurled that banner. And so at the conference, he then made this remark, Did not, don't pay any attention to those, those, those people over there. I'm always kicking their butts. And of course, that, you know, that was a great impetus for us. <laughs> and it was, we were able to mobilize our members and to um, ally ourselves with you know, teachers and firefighters and other uh, progressive forces. And we were able to basically kick his butt. <clears throat> so, so basically, the public trust in registered nurses, which emanates from patients and families, bonds with nurses at the bedside, and the nurses' commitment to social unions and public advocacy, provides an opportunity that we dare not lose to transform our failing health care system and ultimately to transform our society. Thank you.
sitting here next to Sue Cabo, uh, uh, a, 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 who's written a great deal about occupational unionism. So uh, my question is, you mentioned the you know, licensed practical nurses and then, then registered nurses. So what is your perspective on the uh, organization? That is, do you see the importance of, um, of a kind of occupational or even a craft unionism, which is very strong, a great sense of esprit de corps, uh, or to what extent uh, do you look at the, the issue of, for example, who should organize licensed practical nurses and those farther down the, the chain, and then, of course, you know, above as well. So what is your, right. what is your perspective on that? Uh, and, you know. Well, I mean, the California Nurses Association, uh, you know, we, ha we, we, we represent primarily registered nurses. That's just our history. We are, we are we're a craft union. I mean, we were founded as a nurses association. Certainly it wasn't even a craft union. It was a nurses association dominated by uh, nurse educators and nursing administrators. And, um, you know, working nurses, as I said, staff nurses were the ones that, um, you know, felt that they were being mistreated in that organization and transformed it into a union primarily. You're not allowed to hold office in the CNA if you're a nursing supervisor. So we could be a union. Um, we uh, d do believe that the entire healthcare industry ought to be organized and that uh, licensed practical nurses are in unions. We, we work together uh, here in California. We work together with the SEIU of UHW where th that represent licensed practical nurses. They represent nursing assistants. They have programs I, when I was in New York, I, I worked for many, many years with 1199, where we represented everyone. And we had programs in, in 1199. I was one of the trustees where, you know, where there was, we had control over the work. And so we had programs that actually um, helped nursing assistants, home care workers, licensed vocational nurses become registered nurses. As a matter of fact, I went to one of those programs and became a registered nurse through one of those programs. There, we have some members who are licensed practical nurses in a few of our facilities. Actually, right here in, uh, I want to say Ventura County, we represent uh, LPNs, or LVNs here in California, and in a few other facilities. Yes? My question is regarding the program you talked about earlier for the patients, and that the nurse were you saying that the nurses and the doctors as well as the patients could be disciplined if they didn't not follow the, well, the no, program? Not, no, 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 not the patients, I mean, hopefully. Not yet. I mean, who knows? That might be next. I, I don't know. You know, I mean, I'll tell you that we, we I, I can get, tell you a story. I mean, when I was, I was our director of government relations for, for CNA, uh, during the time we were trying to get the ratio, we got the ratios and we were doing uh, managed care reform and all those kind of really good things. You know, there was, we actually did uh, uh, push forward a bill that would stop retaliation against patients because HMOs were retaliating against patients for bringing forward complaints or trying to file lawsuits and it was a you know, very contentious issue. So, yeah, there's retaliation against patients, but not that I'm aware of in these information technology programs. single-payer health care bill passed? Well, what, what needs to happen is that um, the Democrats, I hate to say this, the Democrats in California need to stop um, aligning themselves with, you know, Arnold. And they need to really um, start acting on behalf of, uh, of the natu their natural constituency because what we have is the Democrats putting forward uh, AB8, which is a... Um, uh, it's a it's a health care reform measure that is based upon you know employer mandate uh, they're negotiating with the governor right now and the governor is saying that he wants individual mandate which we are you know adamantly opposed to individual mandate I mean this is basically the DMV would <laughs> there's there's talk about that the DMV would 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 be you know looking at you to make sure that you had health care coverage and if you if you didn't I don't know what they do to you but it's you know not the way we want to go it's not the way we believe our society should be headed so you know I think that there's a strong support for single-payer health care in the state of California all the polls show a lot of support especially over the years as health care has gotten worse and people have been denied health care and um, you know, this insurance industry is, is, is as callous as it is, but we, we have a problem with, you know, some of our, the Democrats in, in, in the state legislature. 
So I think that we would, you know, we need to really make our voices heard with them and that we need to put forward candidates and support candidates who are single payer candidates and stick to it. You, you invited comments, so um, my name is Peter Kahn and I'm the chairperson of the local Healthcare for All California chapter. And the people in Santa Barbara County need to know that we have a very active chapter. And if they want to participate, they don't have to be a member of the, the nurses' union or the teachers' union, a very active uh, uh, advocacy group here. And uh, it's going to be growing the grassroots effort at the local level as well as at the state level with the strong unions and so on that's going to get eventually SB 840 passed. But we really need to convince the politicians that there are huge numbers of us that do support uh, the single-payer proposition. And if we don't understand what that is, there are numerous places that people can go on the Internet to find that out. Thank you. Thank you for your activism. Okay. Uh, uh, do you find it more difficult to unionize uh, nurses that are working in nonprofit hospitals than those who are working in for-profit hospitals? Well, you know, I think that I, I think that that it, it's pretty easy to organize nurses if the uh, employer does not um, employ union busters. So, you know, there's millions of dollars that's spent by these hospital corporations to do union busting, and it's happening in our hospitals. Now, you have some hospitals uh, that have a lot of money, and they usually are the hospitals that have very rich private pay patients or people that have, you know, decent insurance. Uh, they have money, and they're the ones that do everything they can to try to keep the unions out. Um, so that's also a form of union busting. Now, we've, we know many of the standards that we've achieved with CNA are standards we fought for. We went on strike for the, the pay that we have now, even the retirement plans that we have now, retiree health, we fought for that. Many of these other hospitals will just, well, go ahead and give those same standards to nurses in order to keep the union out. So that, that's, that goes on as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jill. And we'll have to tell Roseanne that any time. <laughs> Thank you very much. We will re there are some refreshments now, and we will reassemble here at 9.30 tomorrow morning. Viviana Zelsner will give uh, the academic keynote to the Intimate Labors course. Uh, uh, on uh, caring everywhere, and then we will go to our first panel. Thank you.